Two names have been appearing in the press recently, Barclays and LIBOR. So what is the LIBOR scandal all about? Until recently, this was an obscure acronym that nobody frankly cared very much about. Now it's front page news. So what is LIBOR? What are the implications of the current scandal? And do you need to worry about it? Okay. Just as an aside, I'm not going to say much about what LIBOR is in this video because I have done another video unsurprisingly called What is LIBOR? That was shot before this current scandal unfolded. Do take a look at it if you feel frustrated with my explanation right now. But for those people who don't want to watch that video, LIBOR is the result you get <clears throat> when you ask a relatively small panel of banks in the UK to estimate what they think it would cost them to borrow money around about 11 o'clock in the morning. They submit their estimates. All right, they do it blind, if you like, or at least in theory, they do it blind. They submit their estimates to the British Bankers Association. They then strip out the top and bottom rates, average what's left in the middle, and publish the result as the London Interbank Offered Rate. London Interbank Offered Rate. So in other words, it's a rate, in theory, that banks reckon they can borrow at. All right, or put it another way, it's the rate that the interbank market lends money at. And there's an equivalent rate, for those people who want to know, called LIBID, which is all about if you're depositing money, what you think you could earn on your deposit. But LIBOR is the one that's in the news at the moment. So it's an interbank rate. It's not the same as the Bank of England's rate, AKA the base rate. Okay, that's exclusively set by the Bank of England. This is an interbank rate in theory set competitively and commercially by the banks with, an, with a kind of, again in theory, anonymous straw poll of the estimate of what they think it would cost them to borrow, or the lending rate in the interbank market, if you like. Okay? That sounds pretty boring. You might be thinking, well, how can that make front page news? And the answer is that until recently, people outside the city had assumed that that vitally important rate was set competitively in the interbank market. It was a true reflection of the average rate at which loans were being made in, in the interbank market. And the reason that rate exists, again, the reason there's so much panic about it now, is that that rate okay, underpins huge numbers, trillions of pounds and dollars worth of contracts internationally. Okay? It underpins the price that you uh, can borrow at as a, as a mortgagee in the retail market. Um, the similar rate I mentioned underpins the rate you get on your deposits at a bank. Okay, in the commercial market, it underpins the rate at which companies can borrow, and the equivalent rate, LIBID, underpins the rate at which they can deposit funds. Okay, so there are trillions of dollars of swaps contracts. See my video, what is a swap? For more on those, underpinned by this rate, commercial loans, retail loans, and the rest of it. Okay, it permeates almost every corner of the lending market because it's not just used in this country, it's used internationally as well. Okay, to Americans, the uh, LIBOR rate is a key rate because London, after all, is one of the key financial centers around the world. All right, so what are the accusations? I mean, so far, so what? So it's an important rate, it's used all over the place. Now, here's the point when things were going well, all right, when the markets were calm, when markets were drifting up nicely before the credit crunch, okay, you would straw poll those banks of the British Bankers Association, the results you get back would be quite tight. Everybody's pretty confident that everybody else can pay back their loans. So it's big banks, remember, LIBOR we're talking about, not every single bank in the world, just the, the big solid ones, the HSBCs, the RBSs, that looks so solid now, of course, some of them, uh, the Barclays and so on. So the, the range of submissions for LIBOR is relatively narrow. Everyone's confident, everyone's lending to each other, it's a competitive market. So what happened? Well, two things seem to have come to light since the credit crunch hit. Well, one, Barclays has managed to make the headlines, okay, because it is accused now of submitting dodgy rates. So in other words, its estimate, what it thought it would cost to borrow, it's accused of not telling the truth, if you like, in order to flatter the profits that the traders on its derivatives desk were making on certain contracts. Now, there should have been a Chinese wall, as it's called, a barrier between the people at Barclays submitting the LIBOR estimate and the guys trading derivatives. Okay, we'll find out in due course whether that barrier actually worked or not, but it sounds like it may not have done, 
and Barclays is accused of rather than submitting a genuine bona fide estimate of what it would cost it to borrow in the interbank market, submitted an estimate designed to skew the overall LIBOR rate and benefit its derivative traders. And you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, if they're asking a panel of banks, um, how can one bank submission skew an average rate? And the answer is that you only have to skew it by a tiny amount, one one hundredth of a percent, for it to make a difference on massive derivative contracts. Now, if that doesn't entirely make sense, do take a look at my video as well, or what are derivatives, and that'll get you started. But the point is, Barclays are accused in the first instance, and they may not be alone, of effectively trying to fix that rate to suit their derivatives desk, and that's not the idea of it. A reliable benchmark in the financial markets is not supposed to be doing that job. Secondly, and probably more importantly, leaving Barclays to one side, up to 20 banks over a period of five years okay, may have colluded to manipulate this important benchmark rate. Why would they need to do that? The credit crunch is the answer. That's why I say over five years, because the credit crunch hit 2007, 2008. Okay? Um, why would they want to do that? Well, imagine there's a big credit crunch. Everyone's panicking. Suddenly banks are not secure. Who do we lend to? All right, we're worried. Do, can, we, can we lend to our peers as banks? So the interbank market is seizing up. All right? Now, in a credit-starved environment, you do not want to look like a dodgy bank. All right? You don't want to look like someone that other banks don't want to lend to. So what do you do? Here's what you do. Here's the accusation. You submit your estimate of what it would cost you to borrow in the interbank market low. Why? All right? Because it suggests that you don't find it difficult to borrow. And if you don't find it difficult to borrow, the rate you're going to pay is relatively low, um, then presumably other banks will keep lending to you. See, And that's the bigger and wider accusation that banks, particularly the ones known to be in the biggest trouble, subsequently effectively submitted a, a deliberately low estimate of what it would cost them to borrow in the interbank market. Okay. And the Economist has done some work on this recently, uh, and you know Barclays features in the press comment again because it seems as though conversations are happening saying to Barclays, well, you're a quite a you're quite a stable bank, yet your submission is quite a lot higher than banks that probably were dodgier than you at the time. What's going on? You know, and there's even suggestions that Barclays might, I suggest might, have been asked to lower their estimate a bit because it looked out of line. What that actually says is those other banks were almost certainly deliberately effectively telling the market they could borrow cheaper than they actually could in order to stay alive in the interbank market. Okay? Um, so, two issues out there. Okay, did, Bar did Barclays, we don't know the answer fully yet, did Barclays manipulate the rate? There are some interesting emails flying around to suit their derivatives desk. And secondly, did more banks in trouble once the credit crunch struck collude to uh, submit low rates, get LIBOR down okay, in a bid to show that they are more stable than they actually are? Does this matter? Right? You might be thinking, what's the impact on me? Right. The answer is, if you're a mortgagee, someone with a mortgage, the impact is fairly small. It may even have worked in your favour. Right? Um, if, if banks were colluding to bring the LIBOR rate down a bit in the wake of the credit crunch, that actually will help you if your mortgage was floating rate and linked to LIBOR, if you see what I mean. So in the overall scheme of things, LIBOR might have been a bit too high at one stage, then it might have been a bit too low. Probably in the overall scheme of things, you haven't paid too much on your mortgage. Yeah, that's probably not the big concern. What is the concern then? Well, out in the commercial market where the sums involved are massive, okay, expect a flood of lawsuits. The banking sector is going to be pummeled with lawsuits from big users saying, we use this LIBOR rate as the benchmark, absolutely trusted fundamental benchmark for billions of dollars worth of contracts. If that rate was fixed, we've lost money. And if that's the case and it can be proven, we're going to sue the back legs of any bank involved. So avalanche of lawsuits absolutely guaranteed, but they'll, they'll be mainly between commercial organisations and the big banks. Okay. Wider issue, trust. All right. There's a good chance that this LIBOR rate, I mean, the way it's set is a bit of a fudge, frankly. You ask banks to anonymously submit an answer to a question, what do you estimate you could borrow at in the interbank market? You knock off a few at the top and the bottom, you average the rest. If it all sounds a bit fluffy, well, it is a bit fluffy. So chances are this rate wasn't a really a true reflection of anything. For, for quite a few years. So why pick on it now? Why have the regulators gone at it now? And the answer is, I think they're, they're sick and tired of the banks. Okay, the regulators have been asleep for years, frankly, on this job, so they don't, they're not entirely blameless. Why has the FSA moved now? It's because it's thinking we've had enough. Okay, because if you think about it, the logic of, of, the, of bankers being paid what they're paid, huge salaries, huge bonuses, as they say, well, there's a free market. 
is dog eat dog, man eat man, so to speak. Okay, uh, and we compete to make money. And the LIBOR rate is an example of a free, aggressive market. Well, it's not. Right? If banks were colluding to fix one of the most important interest rates in the world, and people were being paid bonuses off the back of it, it's nonsense. Yeah, absolute nonsense. That's not capitalism. That's some kind of Russian oligopoly, if you like. All right. So there's a big issue of trust here, and what's going to happen? I mean, what's the outcome going to be? And I'll finish on that. I'd say three things. Expect huge legal claims that could clog up the banking system for years to come. Expect calls, probably correct, to break up the big banks. Can you have a trader heading up a retail bank in this day and age? The answer is probably no. The banks will scream, you can't break us up, you can't separate investment banking and retail banking, but there'll be plenty of people who disagree. And thirdly, I'm afraid this is a London rate, clue in the name, LIBOR. All right, so London's reputation as a financial centre will inevitably take a bit of a battering from the recent scandal. Mm -hmm.